Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to ground considerations for PCB layout of mixed signal designs. And this is going to be part two in a series of two. If you haven't watched part one, I suggest you do that first. Before I get started, as always, I'll just mention if you're interested in Forstronics design or manufacturing or training services, check out my website at forstronics.com. And if you like what you see here, hit the thumbs up on the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. All right, let's get started. Okay, what did we cover in part one? In part one, we, we talked about the purpose of a PCB ground plane and why it is used. And then really, we spent a lot of time talking about ground currents, right? Because a lot of designers, including myself, when you're looking at a design, you're laying it out on a PCB, you think of current flowing, but more on the traces. A lot of times we don't think about the current that's flowing in the ground plane. And that current, when we're working with sensitive measurements that also you know, combines high-speed digital or noisy power supplies on that same design board, that can really interfere and reduce the accuracy of measurements. So that's why we have to be aware and conscious of where the ground current is. Now in part two, we're gonna build on that. And we're gonna talk about some strategies, pros and cons of different strategies for doing ground planes and for maximizing measurement accuracy. So we're gonna talk about a single ground plane, a split ground plane, and then an isolated ground plane. We'll also talk about how to estimate the size or the region of a ground plane that a current, a ground current will take up. Okay, what you're looking at on the right is a, supposed to be a very simple circuit. And the reason it's a copper light -like color is it's supposed to represent a ground plane. So I know in part one, we, we looked at the ground plane from a, an example of a two-layer board. And if you're doing a two-layer board, you know, a lot of what I've talked about, about the, the current flow and things like that in the ground plane is applicable. But for this example, we're pretending we're working with a PCB with more layers than just two, because measurement accuracy is gonna be critical here. And my whole point of saying that is, the ground plane represents a single layer on a four or more layer PCB. So like what you see here is supposed to be an example circuit showing the ground plane. This ground plane could be layer two, it could be layer three. What I'm not showing though is the top plane or the bottom plane, which is where your, your traces may be run. And also, you know, I, I picked a single, a simple measurement circuit. You know, I, the front end is supposed to represent, you know, the signal conditioning for a measurement coming in. The, the ADC could also be a, a microcontroller, supposed to be representing the, uh, what's making the measurement. And then here I just threw in a microcontroller and FPGA that's controlling this ADC. But once again, this is supposed to be really simple. What we could also have a power supply chip on here. You know, there, there could be other stuff as far as other microcontrollers, other signal conditioning elements, other control elements, you know, a clock, things like that. But I just wanted to keep this circuit simple. Okay, and the single ground plane approach is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a single layer on the PCB that's used as a contiguous ground plane. So in here, we're not actually separating ground planes in any way. What we're doing, our strategy here, is we create zones or sections of our circuit and we say this section of our ground plane will only be used for analog signals or digital signals. Meaning we're not going to have our traces and our return currents from a digital signal in the analog zone and vice versa. I did this very neat and tidy. I just made half the board analog, half the board digital. Now in real life, you know, it doesn't have to be this evenly symmetrical split up. You know, you, you can split it up based on the, the amount of circuits that go on one side or the amount of circuits that go on another. And the line I put in here is just an imaginary line. One thing a lot of times people get confused about, and, and I've been confused about this in the past, is on microcontrollers and ADCs and, and other chips, a lot of times we see analog ground, analog power supply, digital ground, digital power supply. And a lot of times people automatically assume that that means they have to be on a separate ground plane. And, and the answer is no, they don't. And in fact, as I'll, I'll mention later, sometimes uh, if you look at the data sheet for an ADC, they say that digital ground and analog ground pins should be 
at a very similar or close potential because it can cause parasitic capacitive coupling inside the chip. Okay, so once again, I think that's sometimes a myth that they have to be on separate ground planes. They don't. Now, you do want to have separate power supplies for them, and I'll, I'll mention that later. But the whole idea is if we can map out where our ground currents are, we can create this and lay out our design so that the analog signals stay in one area of the ground plane and the digital stay in another area of the ground plane. But to do that, we often need to know, well, how much area in a ground plane might the return current for a high-speed digital signal take up? Well, that's going to be outlined here on this slide. And before I get started, though, I, I want to make sure that I credit you know, this information is not a calculations I did myself. This table, this graph, as well as what I'm going to talk about, you know, I, I, I got it from this article that's now covered up. But I got it from this article by Henry W. Ott, and there's going to be a link here, and there's going to be a link in the, uh, the video description. But I want to make sure I credit this person for their work. When working with high-frequency digital signals, ground currents tend to try and flow directly under the trace the forward trace. And, and the idea is for higher frequencies, this is the path, path of lowest impedance. And more importantly, the path of lowest inductance. And it has to do with the, the higher frequency and staying close to the, the forward signal. Think of a differential signal, how they travel together. Well, the ground plane is almost sort of the other end of the signal. Okay, so we know that it's going to try and stay close to the trace. Now, something may block it from being at the trace, but that means if, it, if something is blocking it, then you don't have a contiguous ground plane. But let's pretend that it's going to follow the digital trace. Well, we can estimate what is the concentration of the ground current horizontally as well as vertically to the ground trace. What's nice is this is a ratio calculation, so we don't have to worry about what are the units. You know, you can use whatever units you want. But the idea is if we take the center of the trace that's carrying the digital signal, drop below that to the ground plane, we can estimate what is you know, the horizontal and vertical area that the current's going to travel in. And here's just some simple guidelines. You know, If we have a ratio of 2, that's 70% of the current. If we have a ratio of 20, then we know 97% of the current is trapped in there, is it within that space. So as long as we don't put any of our analog return paths or our analog circuitry anywhere near that return path, we should be pretty safe. And once again, this shows horizontal and vertical. I think for the most part, you're more concerned about the horizontal, right? The, the spreading out from the center of the trace. And that's what this quick and dirty calculation can tell you. Now, these calculations are dependent on various factors, so they're just meant to be estimates. But the whole idea is it gives you a good idea of how far you should stay away. For instance, you know, if 97% is within 20, if you're within 30 or 40 or even 50, you probably don't have anything to worry about or very little interference to worry about. But once again, we talked a lot about the return path of current. This helps give you a size estimate for return current so you can then plan out, carefully plan out how you lay out your circuit. Okay, let's talk about the segmented ground plane approach. So this is where we try to divide up the grounds. Now we still somehow connect the ground planes together at, at maybe a single point or maybe more than one point. But for the most part, we want them separated and we create a digital zone and an analog zone. So here I, the black line's most, supposed to represent that they're not connected. And then you can see that they are connected underneath the ADC. Now, I'll mention this earlier. I mentioned this already in the last one, but I'll mention it here. If you're using this approach, a lot of times you want to have the connection right by the ADC because contrary to some belief, you actually often want the analog ground pin and the digital ground pin to be at a very close potential. If they're not, it can lead to noise inside the chip. And I, I'm not going to go into the physics behind that because I probably don't understand them. But uh, I think Texas Instrument has a great app note on how they explain that. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the, the link in the video description as well. But typically you want to have the a connection by the ADC and, and often your ADC or microcontroller is going to straddle the two direct ground plane. 
Now, what might get tough though sometimes is for instance, some ADCs have a large plate in the middle as their analog ground plane. So that just means you need to just structure the, the segmented ground planes to avoid you know, straddling them with the analog ground plane. And then also sometimes it can be difficult because I'm showing a very easy way where we have everything analog on one side and everything digital on the other. Sometimes chips just aren't that perfect. Another problem with this approach is it can lead, this looks very simple because it's a simple circuit, but if you have a more complex circuit, you may get an issue with ground loops because you may have traces that cross, you know, this, this segmented ground planes. And so what that can happen is you may get ground currents that a lot of ground currents flowing between this one little space that you left for, you know, the, the connection between the ground planes. And that creates sort of a bottleneck where there might be a ton of interference. Uh, also, if you have outside circuits connected to this or outside power supply grounds connected to this, you can get very complex, you know, ground currents um, or ground loops is what I meant to say. I'm sorry. And if you're not familiar with ground loops, it typically refers to ground current that has to flow in a large loop. And the reason that's bad is, first of all, you have current flowing all over, so there's more chance of it interfering, but also it leads to that current being exposed to a lot of inductance, and it can also lead to your circuit radiating EMI. Ground loops can also happen with the, you know, the, the single ground plane approach if you have a lot of different outside circuits connected to it. But with the segmented ground approach, you get this risk of a lot of currents flowing through this thin segment where the ground planes might be connected. One of my comments here, and also if you read some of the material I'll link, they also say the same thing. I don't want you to think it's just my idea. There's a lot of question around, is this approach really even useful? Meaning, why not just go with the approach that I mentioned before, the single ground plane, and just be careful to keep your ground currents away from each other? This adds very little benefit above that technique, and it can also lead to pitfalls about the, the ground current and EMI. So, you know, my recommendation would be to go with the single ground plane approach unless you see it having some negative effect where this would be better. This is the, what I used to do, but I no longer use this method. Okay, finally, the last one is the segmented ground plane approach. And this is where we just isolate our circuits and we are taking our analog circuit, our measurement circuit, and we are just totally isolating it from other ground planes or other ground or other circuits that have ground. And so to do this, if we want to pass signals between circuits or communication signals, whatever it is, we have to use something to do that without that, that allows us to do that without a common ground. So the, one of the most popular ways is use opto-isolators or opto-couplers, right? And so this is basically a, an LED that the transmitter flashes and the receiver you know, has a optical sensing element that basically is measuring that digital signal from the other optical element so you don't actually have an electrical connection. Then you can also use specially made transformers. These aren't the transformers that you use in a power supply. They're, they're made for more higher frequency signals, so you can use transformers. I, I personally have never used them for this, this need. And then another thing you can use that I've not used yet, but I I've, I've, was told by a colleague about this, is mini fiber optic cables. So if you want to do a very high speed digital signal, you just get a, they sell these short runs of a receiver and transmitter and a short run of fiber optic cable and allows you to transfer a very high speed digital signal across this without an electrical connection. Uh, even faster than opto isolators. So those are some ways to connect it. I guess a question goes, comes, why would you want to go to this extreme? Because this is going to add a lot of complexity to your design, especially if you need to use mini fiber optic cables. They're, they're not cheap and they're not easy to use or lay out or things like that. So why would you want to do that? Well, where I've seen this approach is when you talk about uh, test and measurement equipment, right? equipment that's making very high resolution measurements. If you remember part one, I showed that example with my DMM, uh, which is a six and a half digit DMM. I guarantee inside that DMM, they have their, their ground plane isolated, their measurement circuit uh, 
ground plane isolated. So for very precision uh, measurements, you tip. this is the approach you would use, is just segmenting your grounds. Now keep in mind though, it's not like you still don't have noisy signals on here, because you still have to take the analog signal, measure it, and then communicate it out digitally. But you know, you, you know where the digital ground current's flowing. You know, if you push the, the digital communication side right up against you know, the edge of the ground plane, you can really isolate where it is. Okay, before I wrap up, there's, I just wanted to make some parting notes. You know, this was focused on ground planes, but what also comes into to play here is, is power planes. So, for instance, you know, for, first off, when you see a chip, an ADC, a high precision ADC, or a fast ADC, you're typically going to have an analog VCC and a digital VCC. Well, typically you want to use separate power supplies for them to keep noise, because noise can be backward modulated onto the power supply from the digital signal, so we don't want to share it with the analog signal. So I, I, once again, I'm not focused on that in this tutorial, but I, I want you to know that, keep that in mind too. And then also, you know, you could use traces for power, but if you need to run power all over your board and you have a more than a two layer board, you know, four, six layers, a lot of times, just like you have a layer dedicated to ground, you'll have a layer dedicated to power. And in this case though, for power planes, we would isolate them, right? So if you have an analog power plane, you would have a digital power plane and there would be no reason to connect them unlike a, a ground where you want the same potential. Here we don't have to do that. And then lastly I'll mention you know whether it's analog devices or Texas Instruments or Atmel or whoever whenever they have you know the ability you know whether it's an RF receiver or a high accuracy ADC whether it's in the data sheet the user guide or even some app notes they might have written they always talk about how to best use their devices to reduce noise. So, you know, one of my parting messages is be sure to read their own documentation because they're going to tell you how the best way to avoid having noise affect your measurements. You know, I focused on ground, but there's other aspects that can lead to noise in your measurements. So keep that in mind. Okay, that's it for part two in this series. If you like what you read or saw here, I should say, please hit the thumbs up or subscribe. If you think I missed something or you want to build on one of the points I made, please use the comment section below. And if you have a question, please use the comment section below. Thank you for watching.